Welcome to the online church service for Sunday the 14th of November. My name is Peter Willis. I'm the minister here at the Caloundra Church of Christ on the Sunshine Coast, Queensland, Australia. Actually, this is being recorded uh, today, which is the 11th of November, Remembrance Day. So for any of the veterans or family members of veterans, we just want to pay honour to you as on this day, we're remembering those that paid the sacrifice in service for their nation. In a little bit, I'll come back and we'll be continuing in our series of messages coming from the book of Exodus, the series entitled, We've Got to Get Out of This Place. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do pause to remember the many um, that have made significant sacrifices in the service of their nation. So we do pray for all those veterans, family veterans, and we just pray, pray for them this day, that they would know that they are valued and appreciated. We thank you for this opportunity now in front of us to once again look at your word, and we do pray that you might challenge us as we consider your word. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Like many of you, I grew up with very specific evening meal patterns. And some of these patterns went like this. One of the five children in our family would set the table, always with a tablecloth. And I do recall asking my mum when I was setting the table, you know, mum, should I put a dessert spoon out? Because I was hopeful we would be having dessert, but we rarely had dessert. All of us would then be called to the table and, and we had dress standards when we were eating at the table. There were uh, five males in our family and, and, and two females and it was compulsory that the men had to wear a shirt when we were at the table. Shorts were optional, but we definitely had to have a shirt on. We had a defined seating plan and once we were seated and the meal was served, it was time for grace and that was shared between us as children and mum and dad. Of course, once the meal started, there was real um, etiquette rules, so to speak, you know, like no elbows on the table. Uh, we always had to use a knife and fork and we certainly were not allowed to turn our fork over but rather we had to get those pesky peas and you know, squash them in the top of the fork and uh, then be able to eat them. Obviously we had to eat everything that was on our plate. And if we were fortunate to have dessert, there was this particular protocol that no one could start eating their dessert until my mum had come and sat down at the table and we still had to wait until she actually took her first mouthful of dessert and then we were okay to eat our dessert. But then I would say probably what used to happen and it was probably my most treasured memory and that was our Bible story reading followed by prayer after our meal and that was around the dinner table. Now we had one of those classic illustrated Bible story books I think there's an image of one, and that is actually the one that 50 years ago um, we used to read from and have at our table. And we were um, often asked to read part of a Bible story each night, and that wasn't all, of course. After we finished hearing the Bible story being read, um, my father would conduct a quiz just to see um, how well we were listening to the Bible stories. And in this Bible story book, the pictorial illustration that seems most memorable to me now will be the topic of our sermon today, the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. Now, I remember studying that image, uh, the great walls of water on either side and this great group of people having made their way through the dry land with Moses on a high point, you know, with his hand outstretched. Now throughout these sermons, we in this series, we've, we've covered a, a lot of familiar stories. Uh, Moses in his ark 
on the Nile. Uh, we've looked at uh, Moses' escape out of Egypt and then the amazing uh, burning bush encounter where God speaks to him. And then, of course, who could forget those 10 plagues? Now, I could spend the next 30 minutes, the rest of the time in this sermon, walking you through the intricacies of the Israelites' journey out of the city of Ramesses in Egypt through to Etham, then the turning back and camping near baal Siphon between Migdol and the Red Sea. I could spend the time telling you of the military history of the development of the new Egyptian fighting weapon, the chariot. I could also spend the next 30 minutes of time trying to help you to discover the exact point where the Israelites walked across the Red Sea. I could tell you about how deep the water was. Uh, maybe we could even consider how it was, what happened to all that water that was backed up. You know, there is a lot of intricacies and a lot of time that we could look and spend um, looking at the facts of this story. And perhaps they would be all valid pursuits of knowledge and, um, you know, in a certain context, in a different time, probably um, a good thing for us to do, but not today. Now, I guess I have to pause now and, and get it done, you know, get it out of the way by retelling you one of the most famous of all jokes about the crossing of the Red Sea. And you probably know this joke, but perhaps it's a little while since you've last heard it. You know, it's the story that, you know, church had finished and, and mum and dad had collected their eight-year-old son from Sunday school and they're driving home and mum asked Jimmy, so what did you learn at Sunday school today? And Jimmy replies, well, um, yeah, Sunday school, yeah, yeah th that's right. Um, he said, Moses was, was leading all of the children of Israel out of Egypt and and then they got trapped by Pharaoh's army. And of course, they had to get across this big river. Um, that's right, um, Moses called in his engineers and they built this floating pontoon bridge which went right across the big river. And then, of course, just as the last Israelite was stepping off that pontoon bridge onto the other side, um, Moses called in um, a joint strike fighter and which was scrambled from a nearby Israeli base and these fighters came in and you know the um, Egyptian army was all on the bridge by now and, 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 they, and they blew the bridge up and killed all the soldiers and, and Moses and the children of Israel were able to make their way across and get away from the Egyptian. And of course dad says to Jimmy, hey Jimmy, that's not really what happened, is it? And Jimmy replied, well, not really. But if I told you actually what they told me happened, you wouldn't believe that either. And it's certainly true that this is one of the most amazing stories as we look at the events that occurred and what really happened here. It does seem like an unbelievable story. But because we believe in a miracle working God, we have no problem taking the Red Sea story in its entirety as exactly what happened. But today, what are the deeper lessons that we can note from this text? Well, can I highlight just a couple of things with you? The first one is what I'm calling the euphoria to fear event which takes place for the children of Israel. Now we left the Israelites in our last sermon having finally been released from their 400 years of slavery in Egypt. The shock and awe campaign that God had rained down on the Egyptians through those 10 plagues have, have led to um, uh, people just standing back in awe and amazement and then as they made their way out of the city of Ramesses, the children of Israel being filled with euphoria, 
being filled with joy and excitement as they were now on their way towards the promised land. And it's hard for us to imagine the the excitement and the euphoria that must have enveloped God's people. They were free. They were stepping into the promises of God and they're on their way to the promised land. They've seen the mighty hand of God at work and I would have thought that their tanks of trust and their tanks of hope and confidence would have been just overflowing. Yet we will see their euphoria quickly turn to fear when they choose to look back instead of to look up. In front of Moses, of them, is Moses. In front of them is the presence of God within a cloud. In front of them is their promise of freedom, their promise of a new land and a new place where they can worship and live for God in complete freedom, uh, well far away from tyranny and slavery. They've just come from the greatest show on earth, And they've seen God work miraculously, not once, not twice, but a decathlon of times. And now we read in the fifth verse of Exodus 14, when the king of Egypt heard that the Israelites had finally left, he and his officials changed their minds and said, look what we have done. We let them get away and they will no longer be our slaves. And you know, without reading the next few verses, you know that the king activates his quick reaction force of his elite soldiers and in like a blitzrig type of uh, fast uh, raid, they are making ground on the Israelites and they are after the Israelites. It doesn't take very long before the dust of their fast-paced chariots is seen on the horizon. And yep, you know it. The text reads in verse 10, When the Israelites saw the king coming with his army, they were frightened and begged the Lord for help. Euphoria to fear in just a few moments. Their fear then led them to issue a tirade of complaints towards and against Moses. Things like, Moses, what have you done? Why did you bring us out, of, out here? Were there not enough spots in the graveyards back in Egypt for us to bury, be buried there instead of you bringing us out here to be buried? And absolute, absurdly, sorry, they say to Moses, we didn't really want you to lead us out of Egypt. We were quite happy there. And in my view, these Israelites had a huge dose of Stockholm Syndrome. Even in their captivity, they somehow thought that that was okay. Can I take a moment to speak of fear? Fear is one of the greatest weapons that Satan uses. And honestly, I I believe that in our current COVID crisis, fear has the potential to rise to dangerous levels, resulting in poor decisions. And I'm not talking about the government here. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about Christians. You know this. But the journey out of this COVID crisis is far more likely to create fear and disunity than the journey that we had into the crisis. It seems like everybody has become an expert on what should happen next. Everyone has become an expert on the solution to our crisis. And as we sort of sing our song of, we've got to get out of this place, got to get out of this COVID situation, people have become filled with fear. And this fear results in behaviour which does not match the euphoria we should have within us that God, through what Jesus did at the cross, has rescued us from bondage and and the desperate situation that we were in. Too often and far too quickly, we move from the euphoria of complete salvation, 
redemption and forgiveness of sin, of a secure hope of eternity with God, to moments of fear and irrational behaviour. We are astounded about how quickly these Israelites jump from euphoria to fear, and to some degree, I too am shocked by how many Christians are allowing fear to dominate their social media searches, their conversations, and their behaviours. Now, I know that I don't know everything about vaccines. I don't know everything about the efficacy of the government strategies to get us out of this place. But I am convinced of this. I place my trust first and foremost in the same God who spoke to Moses from that burning bush, in the same God that brought his people out of Egypt. And I earnestly pray that God would give you and I the hope and the confidence that no matter what the next 12 months brings for us, that God is for us and he is not against us that despite any health or social restrictions, you are still a child of God and we can still have a hope that is secure and sustaining. My role as your minister is in some ways not unlike Moses' role. I'll certainly leave my staff out of the situation, but please note how Moses responds to the fear of his people. It's in verse 10 of Exodus 14. Moses says, don't be afraid, be brave, and you will see the Lord save you today. And that's what I'd like to say to you, is don't be afraid, be brave. The Lord is looking after you. Now these Israelites, they will see a literal and a, and a physical event that will save them from the Egyptians. Yet, as we'll see later in Exodus, they still have a lot to learn about spiritual freedom. So, and um, a few of you may take me off your Christmas card list this year for 2021 after you hear what I have to say, but I want to let you know you'll still be on my list. Please, please listen to my heart now. Exodus 14, 15 says... The Lord said to Moses, Why do you keep calling out to me for help? Tell the Israelites to move forward. Now bluntly, I think God might be saying to his people through Moses, Quit your whinging and your whining, get rid of your fear and get going. And as we know, that's exactly what happened. And under Moses' leadership and God's miracle, the waters are parted and a way is made for them to escape from the Egyptians. And surprise, surprise, when they get to the other side, their fear is once again replaced by euphoria. Why? Because they quit complaining and living in fear and they did something. They got off their whinging rear ends and they got moving. And could it be that in your circumstance, God might want to say through, you, through this sermon today, quit your whinging, get off your social media rear end and recapture the joy and the euphoria of your Christian faith so that you can get out there and sow faith instead of fear. You can bring encouragement instead of criticism criticism. You can speak words of love instead of hate. That you can do all you can to keep unity as your battle cry. To get rid of sowing seeds of doubt or disunity. Now we all know it's been terribly difficult for many people over these past 21 months. And we also know that we will probably still have many challenges ahead for us. And potentially things might get worse before they're going to get better. But please, do not lose hope in God. Do not fluctuate from euphoria to fear, from patience to panic, from care to criticism. And if an 80-year-old man with a stick 
can lead these ragtag bunch of fickle followers through a Red Sea, then you can be a leader, leader in euphoria, not fear. Now in closing, I now want to note how the children of Israel went from fear back to euphoria. The last verses of chapter 14 read like this, starting from verse 27. The water came and covered the chariots, the cavalry, and the whole Egyptian army that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them was left alive. And then we go across to verse 31. Because of the mighty power he had used against the Egyptians, the Israelites worshipped him and trusted him and his servant Moses. So we can see here that fear has once again been replaced and it's been replaced with worship and trust. They are now not whinging against Moses or the Lord. And I guess... Uh, a crossing of the Red Sea event and the destruction of the elite Egyptian forces, well, it, it would have that sort of an outcome, that sort of an effect. And then we see that they start a worship service with Moses and the children of Israel singing a song that I think a, a lot of us probably sang a decade or so ago. And it's in verse 1 of chapter 15, some of the words of the song. I sing praises to the Lord for his great victory. He has thrown the horses and their riders into the sea. Chapter 15 goes on with more words of the praise song. And, and then we see Moses' sister, whose name is Miriam, enter back into the story. Now, the last time we met Miriam, she was at the Nile watching over Moses in his ark. But now she gets to lead the worship band and the singers with her tambourine and singing probably the same song. Um, as we read there in verse 21, the words were, Sing praises to the Lord for his great victory. He has thrown the horses and their riders into the sea. Do you see that euphoria has returned? Just as the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, were filled with euphoria and thanks after they'd seen the amazing works that God had brought about through those plagues. So now they are reinvigorated in their euphoria as they have seen once again God demonstrate his power and his care for them in the parting of the Red Sea and allowing them to escape from the Egyptian army. God's people are now filled with trust, with confidence, and with praise. So we've seen these two great rescues. And we should learn that God is always faithful, even though at times we lose our trust and we might become complainants. And I want to just encourage you, in whatever circumstance you are in, to maintain the euphoria of your wonderful faith, your security of salvation found in what Christ did for you at Calvary, and when that fear begins to rise around you because of what you see or what you hear, I pray that you would just draw very close to God and that you would know his good comfort and care for you. So what's next in this series? Well, you'll have to turn on next week or come to church and share with us here. I've sort of got just one more sermon in this series before we take a break for a month or so and in the new year. Lord willing, I hope to come back to look some more at what occurs in the book of Exodus. Euphoria to fear, fear back to euphoria. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this is an amazing story and we're so thankful that many of us can remember it being told in our Sunday school years or sit it around a meal table as we listen to Bible stories. I thank you, Lord, that there are some deep lessons, though, that we can learn uh, as we consider this story. And I pray for the listener. If they are fearful today, Lord, I pray that you would replace that fear with your joy, your joy of assurance and salvation. Help us, Lord, in our fear to always look to you and to gain encouragement and strength from you. 
I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.